Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions. We start with question number one from Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will next meet ScotRail. Minister Hamza Youssef. Uh, ministers and Transport Scotland officials regularly meet representatives of ScotRail to discuss a wide range of issues relating to rail services. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you to the Minister for that answer. Uh, can I ask the Minister that when he does next meet ScotRail, he discusses the East Kilbride Glasgow train line? with particular reference to a passenger count that I was assured was going on, uh, and I don't yet have the results of that. I am concerned at reports that uh, numbers of passengers have decreased on the East Kilbride Glasgow line. Could I ask it to be placed on record at a meeting with ScotRail that the absolutely convincing argument that commuters have come to me with, that this is because of the nightmare of trying to travel on the East Kilbride Glasgow line because of the shortage of carriages, the overcrowding, and being forced to leave the train before the required stops. Minister. I thank uh, Linda Fabiani uh, for her question. She has uh, rightly raised the East Kilbride line on, on many occasions. The line I'm familiar with, as she knows, it's one that I uh, have travelled on frequently uh, as my own service to get back uh, home. What I would say to Linda Fabiani is a few things. One, the independent review that is taking place for performance. <coughs> Uh, I will ensure that members across the chamber are given appropriately uh, the findings of that when that concludes uh, soon. Uh, what I will also say is that I know Linda Fabiani has met with ScotRail and Alex Hines is very, very aware, uh, the MD of ScotRail, very, very aware of the issues around the East Coast Bride Line. Uh, I will ask about the passenger counts and, and where we are with that and I'll feed back to the member in writing if she won't mind. Uh, what I would say is that there is conversations going on at the moment uh, around the retention or possible retention of class 156 that operate. Um, and uh, if that deal can be struck, if we can hold on to them and retain them for longer, uh, that will help some of the overcrowding issues. But of course, the longer term plan is to get the 385s, the Hitachi trains in. That allows the cascading uh, of rolling stock across the network. And I can give her an assurance that East Kilbride uh, and members that have raised the five circle, those are the two lines that we know that need that urgent attention. So uh, she's right to, of course, continue to raise this issue with me and I'll make sure that she's continually uh, kept up to date. Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Um, Lin Linda Fabiani is uh, absolutely right to raise this. Um, the re recent figures out show that passenger numbers have fallen um, at East Kilbride and Hare Myers, but not all stations on the line. Um, and I think that's because the service in East Kilbride is so poor. Um, it stands to reason. Um, so can I ask the minister, he refers to an independent review uh, and said uh, rather vaguely that uh, that will uh, publish its results soon. What does he mean by soon? Can he be more specific? Uh, and when are we going to get uh, an actual answer on when that line is going to be fully dueled and electrified? Minister. Well, there's a few parts to, to his question. What, what I would say in terms of the service of the East Kilbride uh, line, uh, you know, when I look at the PPM figures and the moving annual average figures, uh, they are generally above uh, the national average. But that's notwithstanding, uh, not, not to dismiss at all, of course, uh, the concerns that he and Linda Fabiani raise uh, of those, particularly on the overcrowding side. I think that's well recognised uh, in the figures uh, that we see. So I, I, I understand why he raises those points. In terms of when it comes to when the independent review will be ready, uh, with the greatest of respect, as an independent review that's taking place, I wouldn't want to be seen to be interfering and saying accelerate that. Uh, I have to give Nick Donovan, who's a well-respected uh, railway expert, the time uh, to complete his review. But he does understand that there's some urgency around this. So uh, as, as when, that is, uh, when those findings come to me, of course, uh, so it will be for ScotRail to decide how that is appropriately uh, uh, shared with members across the chambers. In terms of uh, electrification of the line, uh, dueling of lines, I have said to the member before that, of course, it is for local authorities, for regional transport partnerships to put together a business case, to put together, uh, to go through the stag processes, to go through the grip process, uh, and therefore present that fully robust business case and then come to the government. And there's opportunities, of course, with control period six uh, coming up uh, soon for further rail uh, enhancements. But it would be for the local authority, uh, the RTP and others and the promoters to take the initiative. What I would say uh, gently to the member, just to conclude, uh, is that uh, when it comes to funding new railway stations or new railway projects, we're not helped by the fact that the UK government is slashing our railway budget for control period six by at least now £400 million. And Stuart McMillan. 
Uh, thank you, President Officer. I can ask the Minister to provide an update as to when the, the newer rolling stock will be fully reinstated onto the two Inverclyde lines, please. Minister. In terms of the, the, the Inverclyde routes, uh, the member will be uh, aware that, of course, uh, we are investing very heavily in those 385s. That will, uh, the 70 trains uh, will be about 234 carriages, so they'll be gradually introduced across uh, the network, um, you know, the new 385s, having seen them down in the, the, the plant at Newton Aycliffe, they are fantastic uh, rolling stock. But in order to make allowances uh, for that and allocations for that, uh, drivers are having to go through training. So when we have sufficient new classes of 385s, when they are introduced, uh, then of course uh, we can phase out and replace uh, the older class 314s that run uh, on the Inverclyde right, uh, uh, route at the moment and also free up more Class D80 trains. Now, we are, as it has been documented publicly, having issues with Hitachi delivering uh, those uh, trains uh, on time to, to schedule that we've now agreed with them. Uh, we'll continue to push them. I will get a, a most up-to-date... Uh, uh, I'll get the most up-to-date uh, 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 progress uh, report from my officials, and I will feed that back to Stuart McMillan uh, as best I can, but uh, I promise him that uh, we are working hard to get these trains here to get new rolling stock, which will be, make a real revolution uh, across our rail network right across Scotland. Question number two, Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the Edinburgh Tram Inquiry will publish its report. And Minister Hamza Youssef. Uh, the Edinburgh Tram Inquiry was set up to operate independently of Scottish ministers who have no control over the inquiry's timetable. Ministers are, however, aware that progress is being made with taking evidence that the oral hearings that the latest public hearing date published by the inquiry is the 22nd of February 2018. Deta details of the order of events, documents and transcripts of the oral hearings are published on the inquiry website. Following conclusion of the hearings, Lord Hardy will review the written and oral evidence and other information obtained by the inquiry in order to produce a final report and indeed recommendations. Before publication of the report, any witnesses who are subject to criticism, and it must be notified of that criticism and given a reasonable opportunity to comment. Now, experience in other inquiries has shown that undertaking this necessary step can delay publication of the final report. Miles Briggs. I thank the Minister for that answer. When the inquiry was established in 2014 by the then First Minister, Alex Salmond, the Scottish Government promised the public it would be a swift inquiry carried out quickly, efficiently and cost-effectively. Years later, the costs are continuing to rocket and have passed the £8 million mark, with no indication of when this might conclude. While accepting this is a complex subject, does the Minister understand the level of frustration among Lothian residents at the cost to the taxpayer being incurred? And shouldn't Ministers apologise for making promises over the costs and duration of this inquiry when they simply have been unable to keep them? Minister. I think I, of course, I understand the public's frustration. Can I just remind him, of course, we didn't support the trams in the first place and his party, of course, did vote for it. But what I would say is, can I also just gently say to the member, that his hypocrisy, frankly, knows no bounds. Uh, and one week, one week he demands, uh, drags Scottish government ministers, he says, in his words, to this chamber and uh, for so-called apparent government interference. And now he's demanding that I don't interfere enough and interfere in an independent inquiry uh, for the trams. Now, that is an unacceptable position. I would suggest to the Tory member that he gets a consistent argument uh, for this. This is an independent inquiry that I will not interfere in and that I would have some real issues if the member was urging me to interfere in this. Now, if he wants to write to me with some suggestions of how he thinks that I can speed up an independent inquiry, of course, I'll be all ears to that. Question three, Andy Whiteman. Question three, Andy Whiteman. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it will take to regulate the commercial short-term letting of domestic flats. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Our vision for housing is that all people in Scotland should be able to live in high-quality, sustainable homes that they can afford and that meet their needs. Our commitment to deliver 50,000 affordable homes over the course of this Parliament supports this. Scottish ministers understand the pressure in some parts of the country for new controls over short-term letting of residential properties. We need to strike the right balance between enabling tourists to find places to stay which is important for our local economies and supporting jobs and the needs for residents to be able to afford to live and enjoy living in their neighbourhood. Different parts of Scotland 
face different pressures and we want to support local authorities in taking the right action, balancing the competing demands in their area. We will consider the recommendation and the report from the Scottish Expert Advisory Panel on the collaborative economy and will consult on any proposed changes to regulation, ensuring that it meets the five better regulation principles. I look forward to meeting Mr Whiteman later today to discuss this issue in more detail. Andy Whiteman. I thank the Minister for that response. As he says, the Collaborative Economy Report is now published. It's time for action. Can the Minister confirm that, as the First Minister recognised at FMQs on the 18th of January, there's a distinction between, firstly, a person renting out a room or their property at all times, uh, whilst at all times it remains their main residence. That's the collaborative economy. And secondly, the commercial short-term lit economy, where domestic dwellings are being bought by investors and converted. Does he agree that the Scottish Expert Advisory Panel on the Collaborative Economy looked only at the first of those, and that the second has had little attention from the Scottish Government, even though it's in the public interest, to give councils the powers and flexibility they need to regulate this growing sector. Minister. Um, President Officer, uh, I couldn't be uh, more clear uh, on this uh, than I have been. Uh, and the First Minister uh, said the very same thing last week, is that we will look um, at what the panel uh, has had to say uh, about uh, the uh, situation of short-term letting. Um, as Mr Whiteman is well aware, um, the situations in certain places uh, are different from those here in Edinburgh. And I think if he was to have a conversation with his colleague Mr Finney, for example, um, uh, regulation uh, in, uh, in the Highlands and Islands would have to be somewhat different from here in Edinburgh. Already we have a situation uh, where legislation is in place to allow um, local authorities to take action around about antisocial behaviour uh, in these properties, uh, which Mr Whiteman has uh, uh, mentioned previously in the chamber, in including the antisocial behaviour notices Houses Used for Holiday Purposes Scotland, Order 2011. And that, unfortunately, has been little used uh, by local authorities, and I would expect them to use uh, this uh, legislation as needs be. Uh, we will look at all of this very carefully. Uh, we will uh, publish uh, our, um, uh, our response uh, to the expert panel in spring. And as I say, I'm willing to have further conversations with Mr Whiteman around about this later on today. Question number four, Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on providing faster broadband connectivity in the Stilling constituency. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, President Officer, in addition to the coverage provided by commercial suppliers, the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme has provided fibre broadband access to 12,998 premises in the Stirling constituency. Fibre broadband access is now available to 91% of premises in the wider Stirling Council area, with the vast majority capable of accessing superfast speeds. The Scottish Government is committed to building on the success of the DSSB programme by extending superfast broadband access to 100% of premises in Scotland. That's all premises, homes and businesses in Scotland by the end of 2021. We will invest £600 million through the first phase of reaching 100% R100 programme to achieve this goal. Procurement is underway and deployment will begin during 2019. Uh, presenting officer, this is the biggest public investment ever made in a UK broadband project and underpins the first universal superfast programme in the UK. Bruce Crawford. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for a helpful reply. Can you please let me know, though, what percentage uplift of premises connected to foster faster broadband has been in the Stirling area as a result of investment from Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband compared to what have been without that investment. And while I'm in opposition to, to make any specific commitments today regarding broadband speeds for rural communities in the Stanley area, such as Kinlochard, Shronaclaka, Braga, Turk, and Strathfillan, can you give me an assurance that all of these communities will be connected to foster brand, faster broadband at the earliest possible date? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, yes, I can. As a result of the uh, Superfast Broadband Programme and also commercial coverage, uh, over 91% of all premises in the Stirling area can now access fibre broadband. 
and over 88% uh, presiding officer at speeds of 24 megabits per second and above. And to answer Mr. Crawford's question, uh, and Mr. Crawford has campaigned tirelessly on this issue over the last year's presiding officer, it's estimated that just 59% of premises would have had oh, access to oh. fibre broadband otherwise. In other words, the Scottish Government's DSSB programme has seen an increase of 32% in Mr Crawford's constituency. That's nearly one-third, one-third more people in his constituency that now have access to super-fast broadband as a direct result of the investment by this Government. Question five has been withdrawn. Question six, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the Scottish Government, further to the First Minister's meeting with the family of Sean Woodburn, who was killed on New Year's Day 2017, what plans it has to enhance the rights of victims during court procedures? Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Thank you, the First Minister and I met with Sean Woodburn's family on the 10th of January. We were both struck by the dignity with which they have conducted themselves in such difficult circumstances. I understand the family are with us in the chamber today and I'd like to take this opportunity to offer my condolences again for their tragic loss. Uh, this government has already taken a number of steps to enhance the rights of victims. The Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act 2014 improved the support and information made available to victims. This includes providing victims and bereaved relatives with new rights to access information and reasons for decisions made about their case. It also created a duty on justice organisations to set clear standards of service so that victims know what to expect and who to contact if the service they receive does not meet their expectations. In addition, we published a Victims Code for Scotland, which clearly and simply sets out the rights of victims in one place. It's important that we continue to listen to the experience of victims and their families and consider further improvements that can be made Indeed, we are currently working with our justice partners and victims' organisations to explore a single point of contact model for victim support. This will help to ensure those who experience serious crimes receive a consistent and individually tailored level of support for as long as they feel is necessary. Kezia Dugdale. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Sean's killer received a sentence of just four years. And the family have shared their story with the record today, believe it should have been longer. Of course they do. But they also accept that that's why an independent judge determines these matters. Not the media, not victims' families, or even politicians. But what they can't understand is why no one will explain why that decision was made, what the process was, what was considered and what wasn't. When I raised this with Lord Carloway, he drew my attention to section six of the act that the cabinet secretary mentioned, an act which gives victims the right to request the final decision of a court in a trial and any reasons for it. Can I therefore ask the cabinet secretary, given this right delivered by his government, why the sentencing report hasn't been shared with the family and what steps the government will take to improve the transparency of court proceedings? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, um, sentencing in any given uh, case, uh, including decisions relating to the publication of sentencing statements, is a, a matter for the court. Um, a judge will often give reasons for imposing a particular sentence in court at the time of sentencing or where the disposal is under challenge in a subsequent report to the appeal court. Uh, the sentencing of convicted persons is usually announced orally in court and in certain cases a sentencing statement may also be published thereafter. Uh, the decision on whether or not to publish a sentencing statement is at the discretion of the independent judge in, performance of, in the performance of their judicial function and the Scottish Government cannot interfere with this. However, as a government, we support transparency in sentencing so that everyone involved in a case can understand the reasons why a sentence has been given. And as I mentioned uh, previously in the meeting with uh, Mr Woodburn and his family on the 10th of January, uh, the Victims Code does provide relatives with the opportunity to request from the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service the reason for sentencing decisions to be published and for that to be made available to the family. But of course, in the issues which the member has raised, I will ensure that these matters are highlighted to the Lord President to see whether there's any further progress can be made in improving how the system is operating. Thank you very much. That concludes.